So MIT doesn't have a school of public policy or a medical school, as you know, uh, but we've had big influences on medical science from the science and engineering schools and big influences on policy from economics, STS, science, technology, and society, anthropology, and other SHAS units. And in our own department, we have scholars who work on health as well. Um, and I should say, I'm going to focus on the health part of my work, not so much the broader social policy. So for example, Evan Lieberman has done work about the influence of ethnic politics on the response of uh, the vigorousness of the response of different governments to the HIV AIDS epidemic. Lily Sai's GovLab is trying to optimize response to health and other basic needs in post-Ebola Liberia. And of course, we have many notable alums who are very, very important um, actors in the, in the health policy world, Deborah Stone, Drew Altman, and, and many others. And today, I want to just talk, talk, touch on um, two little episodes uh, of my work on health policy in the American context um, that I, I guess helped influence national policy. I think one of them kind of got me in trouble, which I'll tell you about. Um, so the first episode is about the Medicare Modernization Act of 2003 that went into effect in 2006. This was the reform of Medicare that added prescription drugs uh, to, the, uh, to Medicare. Over time, uh, the fact that Medicare did not cover prescription drugs starting in 1965 from its inception became a more and more glaring hole given the great explosion over time in the effectiveness of drug treatments for many of the, especially the chronic conditions afflicting older Americans like high blood pressure and high cholesterol and so on. And so when the prescription drug reform was created um, under Republican control of the presidency and Congress, it was designed as a market model program. So rather than simply adding drugs to the traditional Medicare benefit, it required seniors to buy separate drug insurance plans from insurance companies. So the theory was that choice among these plans would breed competition among the insurers and competition would drive down price and consumers would be imposing market discipline on these insurers. So my colleague Kimberly Morgan and I wrote a book about the reform, The Delegated Welfare State, which was principally about the reform as an exemplar of the way in which we oftentime, oftentimes design social policies in the United States, especially in the neoliberal era, which is not to have government bureaucracies actually run them, but rather to delegate programs out to private actors, such as nonprofits and even for-profit firms that uh, actually carry out the, the policy. But the other component of our work was uh, that we secured a grant from the National Science Foundation to survey, student, uh, to survey senior citizens, a panel survey of a, of a baseline before the reform went into effect, and then to re-interview the same folks two and four years into the program. And so this piece was a, a program evaluation piece, essentially. How well was the program serving seniors' needs? And we found that those getting their drugs through these new insurance drug plans had lower levels of satisfaction than people who were getting drugs from insurance plans to their former employers or from the Veterans Administration or other uh, existing uh, providers. They also had more trouble getting their drug uh, needs fulfilled. And this market model, we found, was undermined by consumer behavior, which was that people were not imposing consumer discipline because they weren't switching plans. They had an incredibly hard time picking a plan in the first place. Uh, our colleagues here in the economics department ran these lab experiments where they would have different groups of subjects try to pick the optimal plan from among three or 10 or 20 choices. And as you might imagine, people were best able to carry out this task when they only had three choices. In the average state, seniors had to choose from among 45. Um, so people were not making the optimal choices to begin with. And then from year to year, only 9% were switching plans whereas 45% would have been better off switching given their drug needs and given uh, their out-of-pocket expenses. And by not switching, the folks were losing a tremendous amount of money, $600 per year, which given average senior incomes of only $25,000 a year is a lot of money. And the worst part was that insurers, some insurers, were taking advantage of this cognitively cap uh, captive population one large insurer, for example, grabbed market share early on by offering the lowest initial premiums and then later jacking them up. So over the first three years of the program, the average premium rose 35%. With this company, 400%. 
And we found that those seniors who switched at the lowest rates were older and sicker, were more likely to be older women. And so these vulnerable populations were being particularly um, badly served by this program design. So two things about this work. Well, one is it became, um, uh, it got on Senator Tom Coburn of Oklahoma on his list of wasteful government spending. Uh, I remember that Coburn used to rail against NSF, NSF grants, especially to social science. And so my work got highlighted in his 2011 report under the microscope. He said, if you want to know how senior citizens feel about Medicare, you should just ask them. Um, of course, I'm thinking, isn't one of Congre you know, Congress's duties to do oversight of the executive branch? But never mind that. And as Charles Stewart said, you know you finally made it as a political science when, scientist when your research is criticized on the Senate floor. <laughs> um, but I hope that our work helped um, design better programs subsequently. Um, so some of the insights were incorporated into the ACA. For example, how can we help consumers make more effective choices? Well, one is standardization. People are better able to shop across programs, these kind of market model uh, programs much like the ACA, if things are standardized. So the ACA incorporates that. Consumers choose among platinum, gold, silver, bronze plans. The fact that they're sort of equivalent within those categories helps the, the comparison process. People need help choosing. So that was the motivation in many states to have navigators to help people make these difficult choices. And the result is that uh, you know the ACA is far from perfect, but one good thing is that switching rates are higher than they were with Medicare prescription drug. So switching under that program was only 9%. Um, under the ACA, each year, we have 50% of consumers shopping around and 25% switching plans. Now, it's still the case that more would be better off if they did switch, but at least there are some mechanisms in place in some states to, um, to get people to be the consumers that we need them to be in these market model plans. The second episode I'll just mention is um, the subject of my book, Trapped in America's Safety Net. My sister-in-law was in a terrible car accident in February 2012 that left her a quadriplegic. And my brother works for a very small company that doesn't offer any employer benefits, no health insurance and so on. And um, this is before the ACA was implemented. And they had been shopping for health insurance on the then notorious individual market and hadn't been able to find anything effective. And then this, or affordable I should say, and then this accident happened, and she and my brother had to go on Medicaid, which is the health insurance program for poor people, which requires them, even though she's categorically eligible as a disabled person, it requires them nonetheless to satisfy all the financial requirements of being on Medicaid, which is that they have to live at a, a near poverty income, and they had to shed their assets down to the $3,100 they're allowed to keep to maintain her eligibility for health insurance. So this happens in 20, uh, February 2012. Two months later, the Supreme Court was hearing the oral arguments in the judicial challenge to the constitutionality of the ACA. And so I was reading um, Scalia's opining about the individual mandate to buy insurance, where he says that you know, this mandate is unnecessary. Uh, as he put it about young people, they're gonna buy insurance later. They're young and need the money now. When they think they have a when they think they will have a substantial risk of incurring high medical bills, they'll buy insurance like the rest of us. And that just really set me off. <laughs> um, and so I shot off an um, op-ed to the New York Times, which they published, and uh, which then Justice Ginsburg later cited in her concurring opinion on the, um, when the court upheld the ACA. And so I'm happy like in some tiny, tiny way to perhaps have contributed to the policy debate again. Um, just to rail on Senator Tom Coburn again. I can do this because he's retired. Um, after an excerpt of my book on my sister-in-law's situation was published um, on Vox, a woman from Oklahoma, one of his former constituents, wrote me an email. Your story reminds me of the town hall meetings former Oklahoma Senator Tom Coburn was holding after the, during the passage of the Affordable Care Act. A woman was begging for passage of the bill and help in caring for her disabled husband. I don't remember the details of his disability, but Senator Coburn's advice was she needed to get her church and neighbors to help her out. That was, her, well, that was his advice. So now I'm working with uh, advocacy groups to try to eliminate these asset tests for these means-tested programs, because I, we can talk about this during Q&A, I think there's one of the most destructive aspects of means-tested programs that keep people mired in policy and are not terribly effective at keeping 
you know, rich people out of these policies because people with a lot of assets aren't going to go into these policies anyway. Um, so they're just really a, um, a, a policy that keeps keep people trapped in poverty. So I hope in my small way I've contributed to the U.S. policy debate um, and that as we try to do at MIT, make the world a little bit of a better place. Thanks.